that Wednesday evening and Sunday evening of next week there will be no services here um, but we will uh, we will those of you that can join with us will be at Beach Springs we have offered uh, the bus for each night if you'd like to go and um, it's not too late to uh, let us know and uh, we'll be glad to uh, help you be transported there if you need that some people prefer to drive on their own and that's fine uh, but whatever uh, whatever you need to do it, keep that in mind and I was pleasantly surprised uh, this afternoon uh, as I started receiving some text messages uh, from the Cathcarts and uh, uh, Pastors Celeste and Mark Cathcart uh, are all the way from what is it? It's not Roebuck, is it? Union? Is it Union? Somewhere way up, way up yonder, somewhere. And uh, and they uh, they actually pastor the New Life Church, uh, which was formerly known as the Crocker Memorial Church in Spartanburg, and um, or in the Spartanburg area. And uh, so. But they are over at Beach Springs. Uh, uh, Celeste is part of the, the um, uh, band, and uh, I'm not sure if she's going to play the bass or the keyboard or what, some, whatever they need her to do, I guess. And Mark plays, too. And, uh, and you know, if it's got a string on it, well, he can pick it, uh, I believe. And so, um, so just, you know how people have talent, and it just oozes out of them. Well, those are the kind of folk, uh, and we're th th they are. We're glad they're here, and their two daughters, um, Katie Jean and Jolie. Jolie is with Scott, and Katie Jean is out, I'm sure, with Jan, and uh, and that leaves Rachel Ann, and she's out here with Mama and Daddy, and uh, and so we're delighted to have them, and I have uh, asked them if they'd come, and I think. Uh, uh, Rachel Ann is going to share a song with us and so um, uh, they're going to come and they're going to sing and testify and share and, and whatever they feel led of the Lord to do and it's Sunday night we're all relaxed and we got time and we just let the Lord have his way and whatever he wants to do is fine with me alright come on it's good to see you Mark good to have you buddy glad you all are here and uh, they were setting up over at Beach Springs. They pulled their camper down to set up out back and said they wanted to come to church over here tonight. So we're thankful for that. Amen. Glad to have them. Come on here, honey. And uh, let's get you set up. Give us just a minute to get all this going, okay? All right. That's all right. We're a little informal around here on Sunday night. Yes, sir. He's going he's gonna to set you up with the right mic. And this one's blinking. So, uh, it's okay. Check. That's all right. You bet. All right. There you go. There you go.
you go. Are we all right there? All right. Thank you so much, ladies. Beautiful, beautiful, and uh, no doubt about it. And uh, I, uh, I, those people that just move and flow and sing like that, just, boy, that's great. That's wonderful. And uh, wish I could do that. I want you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles tonight to Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, and uh, I want to be reading, uh, be reading there from Matthew chapter six, beginning verse twenty-five, in just a, a few moments. Let me just say uh, before we uh, go any further, how appreciative I am of uh, Brother Barry Hicks. Uh, I uh, know that he uh, filled in on uh, Sunday night, last Sunday night, and Wednesday night while we were away this week. And uh, we got back into town on Friday afternoon, and we had a nice uh, little getaway up in the mountains for a few days. And uh, I can uh, go away, and knowing that I have somebody, and we have folk that are here to take care of things while we're away, I can do it with a lot more ease. And uh, he just stepped right up to the plate, and I did get to hear uh, the message uh, for Sunday night at least. And uh, Brother Barry, just wonderful message from the Lord and uh, I'm so thankful for that and then I heard the good reports from those that uh, he's been visiting in the hospital and seeing about in the hospital and and uh, the Buchanan family was speaking uh, about how appreciative they were of the prayers and the visits and and all of that and and I'm thankful for that and I will say this before I, I speak preach uh, I know on Friday, when I got back into town, uh, we got in, I don't know, somewhere around 2, 2.30. 2.30, I think it was. And so I guess about 4.30 or so, going on 5 o'clock, I was in the hospital. I was up there to see about Lawrence in particular. I didn't realize Ray was still there. And while I was there visiting with Lawrence, Barry came in. And uh, Barry brought a Bible about that thick. And I said, get him good. While you've got him laying there, you just give him everything you want to give him. And, uh, and so, uh, but uh, anyway, um, uh, he didn't do that while I was there. But when, before I left, I said, now I'm going to pray and leave and you do whatever you want to with him while I'm gone. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I do appreciate that very, very much. 
I said at the close of the service this morning, and thank God for the good service today, this morning, uh, and uh, His presence and Spirit here so real with us. I said I was going to speak tonight about breaking the worry habit and the way out of worry. The Bible tells us how we can, how we can kick that problem. And uh, if you have that, if you deal with that, I don't think there's anybody in this room, if you, if you say that at some point in your life or at some time uh, that you don't have those things that go on that bother you, get on your mind and you can't get them off, then, uh, then you may not be being truthful with us. Uh, but uh, the Bible is... And Jesus is very clear on the subject matter as he speaks there on the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 25, and listen to what he says concerning this subject. He says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat? and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? And which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why? Take ye thought of, of for raiment. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they fail not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is uh, today is and tomorrow is cast into the, the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. And listen to these words. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Father, in these moments that remain, I ask that you would just help me tonight as your mouthpiece. I'm not here to be seen, and I certainly am not here to be heard, but I do want you to be seen, and I want you to be heard. And I pray, God, that you would just help us for these moments as we consider this subject, how to be free and break free get out of worry. God, your word has the prescription for us. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us tonight. God, help us to make your word active in our hearts and in our lives and live it out every day. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said before, I think that we all understand this subject matter of worry because at some point or another, we're, we've either dealt with it, we're dealing with it, or we're going to deal with it. And I think we've all been there. And I'm sure that there probably, uh, perhaps it's expressed in many different ways. There may be a myriad of ways to exactly explain what worry is, but let me just tell you what I, and how I sense that it can be defined and what I've seen about it. It's, it's the idea of anxiety or to be anxious, it's troubled or fearful state of mind. Someone said that worry is thinking with our emotions, that we think with our emotions rather than, than perhaps uh, 
the way that we ought to, the right way, and that is in faith, believing and trusting the Lord, of course, as Christians. But we think with our emotions rather than, than letting our faith anchor us. And, uh, and when we start talking about this worry and the experience of worrying, this phenomenon that is called worry, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things that, that we, we deal with. We deal with what we call the racing mind. And we deal, again, as I said a moment ago, with uh, anxious thoughts that, that seem to be unstoppable. Sometimes, uh, as a matter of fact, when worry comes, increase, increased muscle tension, things of that nature, um, uh, upset stomach, people get depressed. They deal with all of these things. It's part of this, this that we call worry. And, uh, and we know that, of course, that God has given the remedy and that there is a remedy. And the Bible addresses the problem of worry. And the Bible addresses this problem head on. As a matter of fact, I want to say to you tonight that worry is no respecter of persons. Sometimes we think, well, you've got to be a certain place in life to worry, and that's not true. We have children that are anxious, and they are as worried as some grown adults. It's hard to imagine and believe. I, I can think it back as a child, and I don't necessarily remember that kind of thing, but, but it very well could have to do with the environment in which they're living. In some cases, uh, where they feel responsible uh, but, but that may not always be the case, but nonetheless, uh, there, there are those times we have children, we have adults that, that are fretting over things. We have senior adults that fret over things and, and uh, they fret over how they're going to pay for their medications and these kind of things. And they're, they're legitimate concerns and legitimate worries that we have, no doubt about that. Uh, and the only antidote to worry is the peace that God gives. I don't know that there's any prescription that a doctor can give you. I understand there are medications that he can give or she can give that will take the edge off. And there are medications and things of that nature that they can give to antidepressants and those kind of things. But I'm not sure that that's the real fix. I think the real fix, as you and I know this evening, the real fix is what God gives and the peace that God gives. That's why the prophet Isaiah went on record in Isaiah said in the Old Testament in chapter 26, verses three and four, he said, he'll keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon the Lord. So when our mind is on the Lord and we have our faith anchored in him and our trust is in him, then, then that will bring us some relief or give us some relief. I've heard a lot of things about, about this subject of worry. If you give me just another moment, I'm gonna get into what I wanna say. And, uh, and when we start talking about this, I read this somewhere. I, I, I heard that it recently read something like this. It said at age 20, we worry about what others think of us. At age 40, we don't care what they think of us. At age 60, we discover that they haven't been thinking about us at all. And I don't know if you've ever thought like that or not, but I think there might be some truth to that. I heard someone else say this. He said, you know, there, there are these people that worry and the people that fret and they fret about things and they fret about what they have and what they don't have. And they worry about what they have and they worry about what they don't have. And, and, and someone said that the groups go something like this. There's those people that have it all and they're worried to death about how they're going to lose it. And then there's that group that doesn't have anything and they're worried to death about how they're going to get it. And so there, there are a lot of ways that we can look at this thing and there are a lot of things that we could say. There are people that worry about money and, uh, and they can't sleep. Uh, as a matter of fact, I heard about a wife uh, who asked her husband who was up during the middle of the night, it was about three in the morning, and he was pacing the floor. And uh, she said to him, said, what's wrong with you? And he said, well, I borrowed $1,000 from Sam next door, our neighbor. I borrowed $1,000 from Sam, and he said, I owe it to him by tomorrow, and I don't have, I don't have that $1,000 to pay him back. And he's wringing his hands, just, just saying, you know, I, I just don't have this money. And so he's 
pacing the floor. He's back and forth. And his wife jumped out of the bed and she went over and she flung open the window. And she hollered out the window and she said, Sam, Sam, Sam. And she woke Sam up. And, uh, and when groggy Sam came to the window and he opened his window, he said, what is it? She said, you know that thousand dollars my husband owes you? He said, yes. She said, well, he doesn't have it. And then she went back, she closed her window and went back to bed and she looked at her husband and said, now we'll let Sam worry about it. <laughs> we'll just let him worry about how he's gonna get his money back. We'll let him worry about that situation for just a little while. You, you go to sleep and let's just let him worry about it. But we worry about those kind of things. And, and again, I'm not saying that these concerns that we have are not legitimate concerns because many times they are. I mentioned to you just a few moments ago, I said something about the senior, the senior adult community and I, I mentioned the fact that sometimes they worry about things pertaining to medical uh, you know, medicines and things of that nature. And you don't have to be a senior adult to worry about how you're going to pay for your medicine. But when you get these astronomical figures on what new medications are going to cost and, and, uh, and, and they say it's going to be, you know, three, four, five hundred dollars a month. And sometimes it can even be more than that. But that's a chunk. That's a, that's a large sum of money when you're on a, any kind of budget in my world. But, but, but in, in a fixed budget, when you have a fixed income, that's a big piece of money. And no wonder we fret. And no wonder we get concerned. Because these things, no doubt, are necessities and they tell us we have to have them. And they're things that concern us and, and we just play them over and over and over in our minds. And I think that's what the devil wants us to do. I think he wants us to do just that. I think he wants us to fret and I think he wants us to worry. But I think the scriptures that I read in your hearing tonight tell us something totally different. I think Jesus had a different word and a different message for us this evening. And I want you to see these thoughts with me for just a few moments. And, I, I, and maybe it will help us to find our way out of this, this subject that we call worry. I think the first thing that Jesus says when he's preaching this, this long sermon there on the mount, I think the first thing that Jesus says when he comes to this subject of worry, he says to them, he says, I want you to look around and I want you to observe God's care in creation. I want you to look around and I want you to see all that God has created and I want you to see how God sustains and how God takes care of all of those little creatures and all his creation that he's made. As a matter of fact, look at the verses again, verse 25 and, and look down with me through verse 29. The Bible says, there, Jesus said this, he said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what, uh, what for your body and what you'll put on and and, and, you know, is not your life more than meat and the body than raiment? And he goes on and he says, Behold, look at the birds. Look at the birds, the fowl of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And he says, Are you not much better and worth more than they are? And notice what he said. He said, Which of you by taking thought can add one cubic in, into your stature. And why take you thought for raiment? Consider, he says it again, he gives us another illustration of his creation. He said, consider the lilies of the field, how they, he says, they grow and they toll not. And he says, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. That God, God took care of them. This, this is the doctrine, what we call the doctrine of divine, uh, the, the doctrine of divine providence comes into view here. And that is like the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, that God sustains us and God takes care of us. All we've got to do is go out and just look around and see God's creation and see everything that's in creation. And when we go out and we look and we see and we see how the birds function and we see how the flowers grow and we see how God sustains and keeps those lives and he keeps that together the way it ought to be. And he says, aren't you worth more than that? Aren't you worth more than all of that? God, God hasn't, listen, we have, we have an intense value with God and God will sustain us 
us and God will keep us and God will take care of us. There's no doubt. The Lord will do that. You know, there are those, I know a few months back and we're getting ready to, we're getting ready to go back into the school season. But a few months back, uh, we had to, I notice I said we, we had to write a report on Thomas Alva Edison. I'm going back to, I'd gone back to sixth grade. And, uh, and I was writing a report with Noah on Thomas Alva Edison. And, uh, and one of the things that, that Noah had to do was he had to, uh, whatever, you know, he had to come back and present a report on the religion of Thomas Alva Edison. And for the best thing that we can conclude and come up with, he was a deist. And this idea of deism, if you know anything about deism, deism states that God created the world and then he left it to his own devices. It was like a clock. God wound it up, set it in motion, and he let it go, took his hand off. And God separated himself. And it's almost like he set, like setting a boat sail, to sail and say, now you're going to sail from this side to the other side, get there the best way you can. And if you make it, if somehow you make it, I'll be on the other side waiting on you when you get there. Well, we know that that's not our God. We know that our God's personal. We know that our God's close. We know that our God speaks to us. We know that our God lives in us and, and he's with us all along life's journey. De- deism uh, is, is that kind of thought. You know, Bette Midler some years ago uh, sang a song and one of the lines in the song, if you remember, she sang something like this, said, God is watching us. God is watching us. You remember that? I can remember hearing the song. And uh, she said, God is watching us. And then she would say this, because this was the name of the song. The song was called From a Distance. God is watching us from a distance. I want to tell you, that may sound good. It may sound like Bette Midler has some, you know, some inclination about God and, and, and what God's doing. But I want to tell you, that's, that's as close to deism as you can get. God's not watching us from a distance. God's not somewhere off yonder, way out in space. I want you to know he, He's our creator. He cares for us. He watches over every little minute detail. If it's a flower in the field, God knows about it. If it's a sparrow that falls from the sky, God knows about it. And if he can take care of them, he can take care of you and me. We are more value than sparrows and we are more value than lilies that are in the field. God sees us and God knows and God cares about us. So when you go out and you look around and you hear the birds and you hear them chirping in the morning and uh, while you're sitting on your patio and drinking your coffee or whatever it is you're doing, when, when you see those little birds and you see those beautiful flowers that are growing out in your, maybe in your flower bed and, and uh, hopefully you don't have a lot of weeds, but when you see those things and you observe those things, just remember that we have a creator and his name is God, hallelujah. He's our heavenly father and he's in touch with you and he's in touch with me and he cares about us. Because if he can take care of those, I want you to know he can take care of you and he can take care of me. And so when you begin to look and observe God's care and creation, then it, it, that in itself, that in itself ought to give us some relief in our troubled mind when it comes to being worried. And the second thing that I would say to you tonight is this. And I think these scriptures bear it out to us, and that is this, we have to surrender to God what we can't control. You know, there's some things in life you just can't control. I mean, it, it could be family members, it could be children, it could be, a, you know, uh, your job, people that you work with. Uh, it, it, it could be medications. It could be a lot of things high prices there are things that are beyond our control but Jesus asked a very provocative question look at it with me please in verse 27 look at what he said he said which of you by taking thought can add one cubic 
unto your stature. In other words, he said to them, who by worrying can add one single hour to your life? If you sit around and fret and worry about all these things I've mentioned, Jesus is asking a thought-provoking question. If you're doing this, how are you going to add any time to your life? He said, you can't even add an hour to your life. I would have to say that if you're constantly sitting around doing that kind of thing, you're not adding anything to your life. You're taking away from it. I think that's, I think that's exactly how we need to look at this and, and the way we need to observe it tonight. We need to recognize the limitations of worry. I want to tell you, I think there are some lessons that could be, we could learn about this, this idea of worry. I think... The very thought that Jesus, the very fact that Jesus asked us this question to make us think, how are we going to, are we adding anything to our lives by worry? I think, I think that in itself, I think there are some lessons for us to learn. I think one of them is this, is that worry is an exercise in futility. I mean, it's, someone said worry is like sitting in a rocking chair and rocking. You just don't get anywhere. You may sit there and rock, but you don't get anywhere. Worry won't pay your bills. It's not going to pay your bills. Worry's not going to get you the promotion you may want on your job. Worry won't bring that. Worry tonight won't restore a broken marriage. Worry won't control your children if you're having problems with your children. Worry won't bring healing in your body when you're sick. If anything, it'll bring more sickness to your body. But it won't bring you healing in your body when you're sick. Worry won't make you happy. There's, it, it doesn't make us happy. It does just the opposite. It makes us sad. And, uh, and, and you know, someone said this. They said besides 92% of the things we worry about never happen. And the other 8% we end up handling. I don't know if that statistic is true, but that's one I found I read somewhere. That 92% of it never happens, and the other 8% we end up taking care of anyway. But worry, listen, worry is an, an exercise in futility. And the second thing I would say here is that worry is a luxury no one can afford. It doesn't add to, it takes away. I think that's the reason Jesus asked that provocative question and that thought-provoking question because he understood what it does. It takes away. And listen, worry, the bottom line is, worry is contrary to the Christian faith. It's not what Jesus wants us to do. Or it's not what God wants from you and from me. Worry is a divided mind. It's a divided mind between fear and faith. Between fear and faith. And we have to focus our minds on the promises of God. And we have to overcome our doubts and our fears. There's a popular song uh, that's out right now in, in the contemporary Christian uh, movement. And it says something like this, that fear is a liar. We talked about Satan being a liar this morning. I'm going to tell you, fear is a liar. And fear lies. And fear makes us think things that might not be, probably are not even so. What it does is it doesn't add to us, it takes away from us. It drains us, it zaps us. It zaps us of our joy, it zaps us of our strength. I say it zaps us of our joy and our strength because Jesus said, or the scriptures teach us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so if the joy of the Lord is our strength and we've been zapped of our joy, and our, then we, we've lost our strength as well. And people just get beat up and beat down. But I'm here to tell you tonight, you can't add anything to your life by worrying, you only take away from it. I want to remind you again, if God can take care of His creation, if God can sustain the flowers in the field and if God can feed every little bird and he sees everyone that falls from the sky, 
And I just want to remind you that wherever you are and whatever you may be facing and whatever it is that you're fretting over and whatever it is that's got you so fearful, you don't have to worry. Jesus is still in control. Hallelujah. He still has everything in his hand and you don't have to worry. Can I give you the last thing? The last thing that I see in this text tonight is this. And that is that we have to focus our faith on what's eternal. We have to look at things the way God looks at things. We have to get God's perspective on things. As a matter of fact, if you look at what Jesus said in particular in verses 32 and 33, he just talked about the fact that they're, they're worried about clothes and eating and drinking and all those things, verse 31. And then he comes down and he says this, he says, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. And he said, your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of these things. And then he said this in verse, the next verse, in verse 33, he said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I think we get it backwards, don't we? Jesus said the pagans, the Gentiles who were considered pagans at that time, he said they run after these things. For them, the material world is important. Food and clothing and shelter. We, are, we need other things along with them. Kind of falls in line with some of what we were talking about this morning. We want love and we want to belong. We want self-worth. We want all those things. Those are what we might even consider, you know, necessities. But the pagans were not concerned about as much that as they were the material things. They wanted the material things. They were consumed with the material things. But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, I tell you, that's what they're seeking after and that's what they're looking for. But I want to tell you what you need to do. You need to seek after the kingdom of God and put God first. If we could ever get people to realize and understand, the answer is to put God first. I deal with people all the time that struggle. Many of them struggle in finances and they struggle I had even just no sooner than we got out of town. No sooner we got out of town, someone hit me up and said, hey, they hit me up on Facebook Messenger and said, hey, I, I need some help. And, and we don't mind helping. I don't want you to, I don't want to give that kind of idea. We don't mind that. But I, I, I want to just say to you, if somehow we could get those people to understand what you need to do is seek God first. Put God first. Give Him priority in your life. Give Him priority in your finances. People say, well, I, I can't afford to do that. They say, I, I can't afford to pay my tithe. Well, all right. I say just the opposite. I can't afford not to. I can't afford the risk that's involved because... I believe if the scriptures, I read them properly, he said that, what did Jesus say? Or what did the, God say there in the book of Malachi? He said that he would rebuke the devourer. Test me and see if I'll not pour open the windows of heaven or throw open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you can't contain. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. That's what he said. But somehow we could get people to realize it. We need to seek God first and seek the kingdom of God first and put God first. Put Him first. Worry is so focused on things that are temporary. We get caught up on the here and the now and things that are temporal and things that are fleeting and passing at best. And really, what we need to be concerned about is an eternal perspective. As a matter of fact, we need an eternal perspective in this temporal world in which we live. And we, remember, we need to remember that the things that really matter. 
Because when we begin to look at things eternally, and we begin to see things the way Jesus sees them, then I believe it changes our view of wealth, and I believe it changes our view of, of ethics and accountability and suffering and success, all these things. When we begin to take an eternal perspective on things, and we begin to try to see things maybe the way God sees them. Seek first the kingdom of God. It will change your whole outlook. Things that used to be a priority for you are not a priority anymore. Things that, things that, you know, you used to strive for, live for. When you get the hold of the right perspective and you get a hold of this eternal purpose that I'm talking about, it just changes your life completely. And Jesus said, if you really want to beat this worry problem and get rid of this worry habit, seek God. Seek His kingdom. Dive in. Get in. Seek Him first. Give Him priority in your life. Put Him above everything else. And one last thing. Remember I said, Jesus said here, therefore take no thought. Verse 31 saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what wherewithal shall we be clothed? Let me show you the last verse, verse 34. Notice what he said. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. And he said this, he said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Here's Jesus' final down-to-earth advice. Are you ready? He said, so don't worry. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The past is gone. The future is not here yet. So just live in this day that God has given you. And trust your future to God. You've got to live in the here and you've got to live in the now, right now. So my musicians come to play for me. There was a, earlier in this same chapter, the disciples or the crowd that was there, the disciples mainly that was gathered around with Jesus, they asked Jesus, said, Jesus, said, teach us how to pray. And you know the prayer that is what we call the, we call it the disciples' prayer. It's often referred to as the Lord's prayer. But I like to refer to it as the disciples' prayer because it was the prayer that they asked him to teach them to pray. And you know it. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he come to this line. He said, When you pray, pray something like this. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Someone said, Well, what does that mean? When you pray that prayer and you pray that way, you pray, God, just give me what I need for this day. And when we awake tomorrow, we'll talk about tomorrow. But for, the, for right now, just give me what I need. we get fretful over things that have never even happened yet and Jesus said sufficient is today the trouble thereof don't get too far out there worried about 
a month down the road or two weeks down the road or three. And I understand there are things that we have to prepare for. I don't know that that's, I don't think that's what Jesus was even talking about. I think what Jesus was talking to us about is let's learn to live one day at a time with Him. And He'll take care of us. Amen. I know He will. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If this world from you withholds of its silver and its gold and you have to get along in meager fare just remember in his word how he feeds the little bird take your burden to the Lord and leave it there would you stand with me please leave it there leave it like a dog chasing his own tail sometimes. 
even though I don't believe it's what God wants for you or me, it's still a part of what we deal, we deal with in this fallen world that we live in. I don't believe God wants it in your life. But I want you to understand, I don't believe it makes you a bad person. I don't believe it makes you somebody that God loves less. Because I think what the Lord's trying to say to you, to remind you of is how much He loves you. So you can break free from that. I don't want anybody to go home in that condition. I want you to go home free and have the peace of God in your heart and over your mind. If you're one of those, you say, Pastor, I, I've, just, I've just been worried over some things. There's some things that I, I can't help it. I know it's not what God wants, but it's just, it's, it's just bothering me. If that's you, why don't you just slip your hand up for me, will you? Let me see you. We got some? There's, there's some. You got some? All over the place. All over the place. Now here, here we are. We're just a family. We're family. That's all we are. I want us to minister one another for just a few moments this evening. You, we've seen hands. I know, I know Paul has been having some, a, a struggle. He's had a struggle. I know that. And, uh, and, and I want us to pray for Paul. Danny raised his hand. Danny, we want to pray for you. We sure do. And I, I know you raised your hand, darling. And we, I, want, I want us to pray for you. I want, I want some of you, to, let's pray. I saw some over here, Brian. Who else? Was anybody? Dee Dee? Dee Dee? All right. We're going to pray for Dee Dee tonight. Rachel Ann, did you raise your hand, darling? I didn't see you. That's all right. The Lord saw you. Now, you see, there's a lot of people that need prayer this evening. A lot of people that need prayer. Now, I want us just to believe God. Let's believe God tonight. They'll be set free. Whatever it is that's plaguing them, listen, fear is a liar. Satan is lying to you. That's why we, this morning our message, The Father of Lies, or, or how he lied to Satan, the series, The Father of Lies, how Satan lied to Jesus. He's lying. He's lying. Whatever it is he's trying to tell you, I'm here to tell you, I, I know God's word says just the opposite. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be fearful. That can be broken tonight in the name of Jesus. Why don't, let's gather around some of these. Will you help me? Help me. Come, come on around. Let's gather around some of them. Dee Dee. Some of these over here. Come, come on up here, darling. Come on, Angela. We had and, uh, uh, Ellen here. We'll pray for Ellen. And uh, Amber. Let's pray for Amber. Danny. Paul. Come on. Will you gather around them? Help me. Will you do it? Let's believe the Lord. Let's believe the Lord. Come on. Let, let's just ask the Lord right now in the name of Jesus. Father. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. Lord, your word says that if you care for your little creatures if you see every sparrow that falls from the, the ground if, if you can feed the, the birds of the air and they don't have to gather they don't have to do anything but just depend on you if the lily of the field can be clothed in all of its beauty and it can grow and it doesn't have to have anything that we a man can do or anything we can offer but it's everything you can do. If, if, if you can sustain that and you can take care of that, then you can take care of us tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can take care of us. You can take care of our situation. You can take care of our finance needs and all of our other needs. And in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. We're believing you tonight, God, for your touch. Hallelujah. Oh, God, to be set free by the power of the Spirit of God tonight. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, we don't have to fear. We don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. Oh, God, if you take care, oh, Lord, of the birds that fly in the sky, and you feed and sustain them, Lord God, and you take care of the flower that's in the field, and you clothe it and you keep it, God, then you do the same for us. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. 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 In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> In Jesus' name, Lord, touch Tammy right now. In Jesus' name, her body, Lord, God, her mind, Lord, in the name of the Lord. We're believing you tonight, God, for her touch. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name. Touch Ellen. In the name of Jesus, God, do your work tonight as only you can, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Leave him there. Leave him there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave him there. If you trust and never die, God will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord. And leave them there. Leave them there. Leave them there. Take your burden to the Lord. And leave them there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Glory, glory, glory. Yeah. 
He will never leave you then. He'll go with you to the end. Take your burden to the Lord and leave them there. Leave them there. Yeah.